Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a special guest who's going to talk to us about an, an interesting topic, but before that, a few comments. As you know, every Thursday I try to give you hints about historical figures or historical events that have shaped the way we think about biology and medicine, and so today is no different. So we remember today Hans Walter Coxterlitz. I hope I said that well. Hans Walter Coxterlix. He was born on this day, born on this day back in 1903. And he was a German born British pharmacologist who'd already retired. But after retirement, kept on doing research. And he was in Scotland. He discovered in 1975 with Dr. John Hughes encephalins. So he actually was the one who described encephalins that these are, uh, as you know, uh, agents produced by the brain uh, that actually help you in response to perception of pain, for example. So remember that name. On this day was the death in 2004, recently, of Roy Walford. You remember Roy Walford? So Roy Walford, Walford Roy, Roy Lee Walford Jr. was an American pathologist and gerontologist who pioneered and actually wrote a number of books on how restricting food intake prolongs life. And so he actually had a restricted diet. He would not go beyond 1,600 calories because he wanted to prove that in doing so, he would live until 120 years of age. Okay? And this idea came about from his own studies in the 1960s where he actually fed mice only 40% of the daily typical calorie count, and he could double the lifespan of those mice. So he was very adamant that you just, by decreasing calories, you could do that, which we failed to do last night during dinner with our guests. But uh, he also lived in Biosphere 2. I don't know if you remember Biosphere 2, but I was around in 1991, and Biosphere 2 was an attempt to see if humans could live in a self-contained, self-controlled, sealed environment. So he lived there for about a couple of years. Now, the only thing about having eaten a lot last night in dessert and against the theory of Dr. Roy Walford, is that he actually did not make it to 120. He died at age 79 of complications of Lou Gehrig's disease. And therefore, tonight, I will have dessert again. Now, I want to finish with Max Rubner. Max Rubner died on this day in 1932 at age 77. He was a German physiologist who showed that available energy content in food was the same. It didn't matter if you ingested it organically or merely burned it. And this was back in 1894. In 1883, he actually used geometry to compare metabolic rates of animals of different sizes. So he actually, I'm going to read this to you. So he actually came up with this idea that if an animal is n times taller than another, it has a surface area of n to the square greater and a mass of n to the 3 greater. Thus, the total metabolic rate, depending on loss of heat from the surface area, would be proportional to m two-thirds. And it just goes on and on and on. And it took about 50 to 60 years before anybody used that formula and worked on it and expanded a little bit. And some of these formulas are used today. So we remember Max Rubner for that. And now I'm going to introduce Dr. Mohamed Saad, who you may or may not know is a new division chief for pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Now, most of you know Dr. Saad. He's been around uh, this place since 1999. He actually did his fellowship training here and has been instrumental in the establishment of, of ICU at uh, Jewish Hospital. Uh, the sustenance and maintenance of the sleep laboratory at UofL at a time when the institutions did not want to keep it over and has been program director for the fellowship uh, for quite some time. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mohamed Saad, who's going to introduce our special guest of the day. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Peter Morris. Uh, he's actually a New Yorker, so uh, we found out about this uh, last night. So he grew up in New York, uh, did his medical school at Cornell, graduated in 85, and uh, did his internship, residency, and fellowship at Vanderbilt. 
and started his academic career actually at Vanderbilt for two years as an instructor of medicine. From there, he came to Kentucky for about six years as an assistant professor uh, at UK, then moved to Wake Forest for about 16 years and moved up the rank until he uh, became a professor in 2015. And then he decided to come back at UK again as a chief of division uh, in 2015. And you look at his uh, accomplish accomplishment, of course, uh, his interest was in the ICU, um, several NIH grants looking at the acute lung injury, RDS. But he focused more of his attention recently into the uh, rehabilitations of the ICU, something that we as an intensivist, we overlook, um, myself and others. We focus more on caring for patients, preventing from dying, but we don't really pay attention to the long-term rehab and the effect of muscle weakness and so on. So his talk today is going to be on the uh, muscle weakness and how we can prescribe uh, exercise therapy for our ICU patient. And I'm uh, confident that you will really find an interesting information and data that you'll present. Um, so Dr. P Peter Morris. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for those lovely, lovely introductions. Congratulations, my friends. The title of the talk is meant to be a title for internal medicine. Uh, very, very seriously, all of us touch the theme of exercise. The examples I'll have of how to blend exercise with critical care are such that we can then learn the principles better of exercise, but there's no one in the room, none of us who are internists are untouched by the themes our patients come to us with that can be addressed always with exercise. So conflicts of interest are funding. If there's one point I could leave with everyone as they go home today and think about this talk further, is a concept that's being driven by lots of groups of scientists and clinicians is for all of us to think about exercise as a drug. We're internists. We know a lot about the habits of pharmaceuticals. Exercise is a little bit of a different animal, but sometimes it may be worthwhile for us to capture the theme of exercise like we would a drug. And if we do that, then we can talk about a dose of exercise. How do we prescribe exercise? How often? How long would you allow the same dose to continue? Importantly for us and for our patients, we have to begin to think about exercise and side effects for different subgroups of populations. But overwhelmingly, I'll leave you with this thought as well, exercise may be our best drug. In terms of safety and efficacy, the literature is overwhelmingly positive for exercise studies with benefits related with a minimum of side effects. And it's not FDA regulated. There's two points on this slide to bring to everybody's attention. One is a World Health Organization statement about non-communicable diseases as threats to life. And they've ranked physical inactivity as the fourth leading risk factor for morbidity and mortality worldwide now. Worldwide, fourth leading factor of non-communicable diseases. The second point here is a very important publication that's come out of Canada, and it's linked to our own American College of Sports Medicine. American College of Sports Medicine has a similar publication they're in writing now, but it's really our blueprint this is our architectural blueprint for how we speak exercise to our patients. So it's something to keep around on our desktops to peek at every once in a while and get the numbers from here and to have the defense of the strategies that is promoted within this document. This is a very important publication. And like other guidelines from all of our subspecialties, this is renewed our last American College of Sports Medicine was published in 2007 or 8, and they're due now for another big publication. Let me put the exercise importance in context of our patients who have the unfortunate 
uh, need to experience an ICU stay, organ failure in the ICU and the aftermath. So survivors of an ICU stay will not only have the insults rendered by their disease, the insults rendered possibly by us trying to help their organ support, but that unfortunate legacy goes on. Now our literature is robust with it doesn't get better in a week, it doesn't get better in two weeks, two months. Years out from an ICU stay, there are lingering side effects for these patients. More importantly, we are seeing how do we assess the trajectory of someone coming into an ICU stay, not only from their organ function, and what's available in charts and records sounds more like PFTs, echoes, and urine analysis, and creatinine. But what we don't have is, what was your minute time in the mile? How many miles can you walk? We don't have a functional assessment that's easily transferable across our health visits. So judging this trajectory into an ICU stay is very difficult. What we're seeing, though, emerge is that you hear stories of muscles just disappear in the ICU and there's a lot of atrophy in the ICU. There is. But also the notion is growing that people have atrophy before they hit the ICU. Our populations of diabetics, heart failure and COPD in our geriatric population suffer with muscle wasting on a good day at home. And sarcopenia is a term that's been coined, has been coined by the geriatricians to apply to this muscle wasting that we see prior to any direct insult in an ICU. So here are some CDC definitions of physical fitness. It helps us understand the components of what we need to help our patients move better. Body composition, how much fat or muscle, cardiovascular endurance, flexibility. From an ICU perspective, this is important. We're hearing more and more patients are afraid to do their housework. Why? They're afraid of bending down, they can't get up. They might fall over. They don't go to the store, they can't put the cans of food back in shelves that are great, bigger than their shoulder, because in the ICU, their shoulders had become frozen. Muscular endurance, can you do your dishes? Muscular strength, can I pick up a five pound bag of sugar? So with those components, more and more, these themes come to us from the exercise uh, groups of experts who teach us how to then portray these components into real-time themes. Speed and power are going to be something that, for all the people in training now, become very commonplace. Power is something that our elite athletes know very well. They, they train for power. But power is a, a concept that's important even for our patients coming out of the ICU and going home. Power is this example. Power is something where someone goes home from an ICU stay, they get into their lounger, and they get up, answer the door, and they trip over their cat and fall. And we say, what happened there? Well, grandma doesn't have the reflexes she used to. The exercise physiologist would tell us, we haven't trained grandma for a power to lift her leg quick enough. Her hip flexors haven't been trained well enough. So there's training for power, for speed. Power also relates to their ability to prevent falls. Balance is important in that as well. So important concepts that a generation after us possibly will have as the ABCs. Okay, here's possibly the most important prescription item for us today. What's in the prescription of exercise? And this is generic for all patients. This is CDC guidelines. Take a look at what this is. Aerobic activity for health benefits. 150 minutes every week, moderate to intense aerobic physical activity. And then if we go even higher on the scale of vigorousness, vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity for 75 minutes every week. 150 minutes, it's not a day, 150 minutes a week. Impressive numbers. And importantly, point out to our patients, does it have to be all big sessions? No, 10 minutes at a time. Studies show that benefits are to be gained with 10 minutes at a time, so you can break the 150 minutes up. It's an important thing to talk about in our face-to-face -face meetings. So what is moderate intensity? Because we have to say, well, what would that be, Doc? How, how do we do that? Walking briskly three miles an hour, if that's a 20-minute mile. Being in the water 
literally being in the water, moving in the water. And if anyone has a bicycle with a speedometer on it, has anyone tried to ride a bicycle less than 10 miles an hour? That's a challenge. You fall over. <laughs> Ballroom dancing and general gardening for that time period. So vigorous activity is a little bit more in depth in swimming laps, playing tennis, bicycling, jumping rope, walking. These are very important guides for us to tell our patients about. Now, the drug of exercise, dose response. You do a little bit more, you get more response. That's an important part of our drug analogy, that if you do more than the 150 minutes, additional health benefits by the literature are clear for many, many, many subgroups of patients. In addition to aerobic exercise, there's strength training. That's less clear how to, say, how to advise. It has to do with hand weights mostly, maybe ankle weights, moving what they're saying involve all major muscle groups. Not as clear, but it's part of the overall advice for the prescription. What are we up against as clinicians? Many, many different factors. Here's one, and it has to do with obesity and moving a mass. So this is CDC data. It's looking at body mass index percent of the population uh, estimated at a BMI of 30 or greater in, this, in each of our states. The highest number in the darkest color is 35% of the population with a BMI over 30. Our state, Kentucky, just missed this cutoff for this publication at 34.5, but you can see this band emerging here. We're not as lean as our Western counterparts, but this is one of our challenges, no doubt. Unfortunately, this is another factor. Where are we now in terms of our fitness? This is all adults. This is not adults with health issues coming to see clinicians. This is all adults. And it's looking at the percent of adult populations who achieve the minimum physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes. So we can say, as of this piece of information, about a fifth, 20% of the adult population does this. 20%, one fifth, will do 150 minutes a week. Not a big number. So we have challenges. The sixth vital sign is emerging from our geriatricians. The sixth vital sign in our assessments in clinic is walking speed. And Stephanie Studensky put this brilliant collection of works together to help put it on the map in JAMA. And it may become that when we teach medical students in a couple of years, we ask for our typical vital sign and say, what was the patient's four meter, four meter gait speed? Particularly important in our geriatric population, hasn't been re reproduced in younger groups, but gait speed, and I'll just read you the fine text here. I wanted you to see the, the journal article. Gait speed with gender and age was as predictive of outcome and survival as putting together factors such as chronic conditions, smoking, blood pressure, BMI, and hospitalization. Gait speed, what does it look like? It looks like median survival can be predicted at different ages by literally measuring someone's speed. You have four meters, four yards, and you say, hey, walk your normal distance speed. And you go through that and you time it. It's not hard to do. You don't need expensive equipment. But it's helpful to get a sense of where our patients are. Importantly, and some brilliant people in this room who are young will take this on, I hope, we have not seen yet that someone takes a gait speed and by instituting an intervention of exercise, can you alter the curve? So is it able, are we able to then say, you are here at your gait speed now, but if you do this intervention of exercise, you'll come higher and better on the curve? Hopeful. OK, how do we do as delivery, and how do we do in teaching? What, are, what sources can we point to? This is an important 10-year-old now. It's now 10 years old movement out of the American Medical Association and sports medicine. Exercise is medicine. The EIM initiative is very, very important. And it's important for so many different reasons of teaching our patients, but teaching our people in training about exercise. And their big point is how do all of us who are already established help push these themes in curricula, not only in medical school, but in residency. So pushing these themes of are we evaluating our patients for organ function, 
but functionality, the whole organism. How much are they moving? Some in information for us about how is our intervention in clinic, number needed to treat to convert someone from a uh, sedentary type of existence to matching the physical activity guidelines, 1 to 12, comparing that to someone trying to intervene on smoking, it's much better ratios. So we're effective at speaking to our patients. Now, this is interesting, and then the believability of this, that it sounds like all of us, if we are more physically active, we tend to take histories better about people's functionality and believability. So this may be part of do what I do and do what I'm saying. Okay, the anatomy here of what we would talk about when we discuss elements with our patients, the types of physical activities to review, aerobic activity, but also the strengthening, stretching, the flexibility. And this is a blend uh, of, con of concepts, the neuromuscular activity, but balance as we get older is so important to avoid injury. Take home point for our people in training. This is one of several ways to remember when you speak to your patients, what am I going to speak about in discussing how the prescription is delivered? The FIT principle, FIT principle of prescribing aerobic exercise. So the frequency, it doesn't have to be that you're running a marathon every day. So we're talking about the number of days that are realistic to get the 150 minutes in. Intensity is important to discuss someone who is very sedentary. It's very minimal. We saw the list of just walking. How much time and the mode of exercise performed. Some people say, I live on a, near a busy highway. I can't walk on the street. OK, let's see how we can figure out how to get the, the mode of exercise in. Interesting concept. How many people in this audience have watched a movie in the last month? All right, how long was the movie? About two hours, two and a half hours if you start and stopped your TV and got a drink. So. 150 minutes is two and a half hours. It's about the time. It's, a, it's a, an idea and a concept that we can help tell our patients about. How long are we talking about, doc, to exercise? It's about a length of a movie. It's a, little, it's a long movie, but we have to do it. Who are our colleagues, medically trained colleagues, who think this way and help us? Certainly physical therapists and occupational therapists. In pulmonary rehab, it is a great deal of the component of respiratory therapists and believe it or not, exercise physiologists are emerging as the people that we're relying on to understand the sports medicine literature to help apply now to patients who have disease. So whether we call it rehab or whether we call it exercise training, these folks are going to help deliver and translate for our patients. More specifically, you'll hear these principles, overload, specificity, assessing initial fitness and progression of the program. This may be a concept for us. If someone is actually doing it and they are seeking how to get better, the overload, you have to perform more than one's normal amount of exercise to get to the best step. People have been taught to say also, this is akin to wearing braces on our teeth. We don't go to the, the orthodontist and get braces put on and think tomorrow I'm going to have straight teeth. It's a slow process of change over months, and that's a concept we can tell our patients. But you have to stay at it. You have to wear your braces. You have to do your activity. Unfortunately, in our country, how long does rehab last if you get one of your patients into a rehab formal insured program? The determinants now are generally set by how many patients you are trying to get in, what's the reimbursement, and unfortunately, somewhat of patient motivation. But there are literature that says that if you had patients longer in the programs, there are some studies that say, well, let's go beyond what the usual 12 weeks are now and see if you get extra gains. You do. It's, the literature tells us this. But unfortunately, our patients do have diseases. They experience exacerbations. And also our literature says, and for us to be on the lookout, look out, that if they have exacerbations, we know they're going to be less active. And they're not going to come back as rigorously, and they fall off the curve. And see, the literature says a gradual decline in adherence, even though they had gains in the rehab program. So how to speak more fluently with the exercise physiologist. If you want to speak energy consumption, you can speak METS. You can speak heart rate max, VO2 max. So most of us here 
they would say are spending a one met. So one met has to do with a kilocal per kilogram per hour. That's the basis. I'm sitting down, I'm sedentary, I'm not moving. That's one met. So each of our exercises in terms of light, moderate, vigorous, you can say in terms of different from being sedentary and sitting. If we're going to teach about this, this one study has been pointed to as been a brilliant display of information to say dose response for exercise. And it's uh, about 12 years old now, 11 years old. It was published in 2007 and collected in 2006. Taking a group of overweight, sedentary, postmenopausal women with elevated blood pressure and putting folks on treadmills with a prescription of time to get a certain amount of energy expenditure. Over 400 women were enrolled in this study with different doses of exercise versus control of nothing during the time frame. And at six months, there was a dose response depending on the dose of exercise they received. It's been reproduced in several different areas, but this is a beautiful reproduction or a production of how to teach exercise and why it's important for patients to say, if I exercise more, will we get more benefit? We think so. You can exercise more and changes to our bodies occur. Also a point for our, our students in the room that what are we trying to accomplish if we send one of our, say, lung patients to pulmonary rehab? Remember the data. The data say that if I send a COPD exacerbation patient from the hospital to rehab, their PFTs will get better possibly from healing their lung. But over time, if it was an exacerbation in the hospital, what changes in rehab is not spirometry. What changes in rehab is their muscular skeletal system. So PFTs in the literature, why insurance pays for this, isn't because the PFTs changed, but overall performance changed. And that's what got the insurer's attention. That's why we have programs such as this. We were invited a couple of years ago to write an, uh, a piece of review to try to synthesize a problem based on exercise impairment post-ICU. And a colleague of mine, Clark Files, put together this uh, diagram. And in it, he was trying to say, ICU patients have an early injury and then recover and still have some residual, and trying to break it down into lung function. Muscle atrophy mechanisms are ongoing in the ICU very aggressively. But then, importantly, muscle function. And this is going to emerge as the theme. Muscle function, and do patients actually have the ability to recover, partially recover, and for those poor, poor folks who don't recover well. So the theme of muscle function. That goes into what are we trying to do for our ICU patients? What's the lesion? The lesion we're trying to help from an exercise point of view is, of course, fix their cardiopulmonary or brain issue, but also to address profound weakness and, long, and loss of function. Why is weakness a big deal? Weakness has been tagged to survivability over the year after ICU discharge. Depending on how weak you are when you leave the ICU, studies now show your degree of weakness helps us predict if you're going to live for the next year. This is a very well done study. It's quoted often. It was set up beautifully as a sub-study to a nutrition study. So they were looking at people for a nutrition study. Thousands of patients enrolled. And they looked very carefully to get 122 pairs of patients, very well matched, but different in their immediate post-ICU strength. And what they saw was the people who were more weak had longer time on vent, died more often in the hospital, cost more to take care of, and importantly, if you're subject to weakness, your survivability is less. They put it into a graph this way. MRC score is 5 over 5 or not. In each of our limbs, your score should be 60 if you're normal. Depending on your score, when you leave the ICU, you could, in these patients, predict their outcome over a year. Survivability is worse. Again, the question would be, OK, can you intervene on this if you do exercise aggressively? Still, the story is out. How do you know when to start moving an ICU patient? It's become very simple. We ask questions that are more cranial nerve oriented and brain. If you get three or five of these questions, open your eyes, look at me, open your mouth, and put out your tongue, nod your head, raise your eyebrows when I have count to five. 
That means their brain is enough where they can start following commands as they're exercised in the ICU. It's not judged by how strong their arms and legs are or their grip strength in the ICU because they are profoundly weak. What's our biggest barrier? Potentially, it's what we do. What we do to patients is sedate them in order to have their tubes lie where we think the tube should lie. So a growing theme within critical care is how do we take care of someone, keep them calm, comfortable, and not use a pound of benzodiazepine per day. That's a challenge. It's hard, but the emergent themes are to get rid of this barrier. So again, challenge to the brilliant young people in the audience, find a way to keep these tubes in place or not have a need for these tubes so we don't have to give our patients high loads of very sedating medications. Another thing we do to patients, you say, well, did you really need seven to eight quarts of fluid to resuscitate someone? This person's hand was so swollen, she couldn't help herself, she couldn't grip the handrails. Her hands were so swollen, she couldn't grip. And it's a common phenomenon in our ICU patients. Getting someone upright has become a theme. Uh, having their brain engage and look at something. Everyone just gaze upward. This is what patients look at in the ICU. So having people see something other than the ceiling has been thought of as an engagement to help bring them back to us. An interesting phenomenon that uh, physical therapists say now, not in the institutions I've worked at, but internationally, is they've become very aggressive in assessing patients while they're flat, vertical, and they're trying to get people horizontal. And the rest of the clinicians are a little bit more cautious and say, well, they don't look very ready. They're not engaging you. Physical therapists might say, let's see what they do when they get up. And they won't give up sometimes until they have this kind of effect where the person can actually get up, sit vertically, not horizontally, sit vertically, and look at them. Now, anybody who used to take home call Tell me, would it be better if you spoke on the phone lying flat when your beeper went off or you had to say, hold on a second, let me get up, and then you spoke on the phone. And then you say, oh, I don't know if it's perfusion of the brain, but the, the physical therapists say, we don't really say no until we actually get them up. Standing. The debate now is, do we walk in place, marching, or is there something actually about walking patients? So this has become a debate within the subtext of the research within ICUs and also not limited necessarily to whether or not you need mechanical ventilation via an endotracheal tube. Two pictures here I'll show you as the consequence of well-intended therapy, but not necessarily the best therapy. This woman has allowed us to teach points based on these photographs, and she is a vivacious, engaging, wonderful, lovely woman who has bad COPD and has been in the ICU a lot. And I would urge people to take a look at her eyes. These are not her typical gaze. And she was uh, through a, a COPD exacerbation with pneumonia and required mechanical ventilation. And we showed these pictures to her when she came back to our research clinic follow-up. And she has no memory of this at all. She stood on the side of the bed and she moved and walked to the chair and engaged in activity. She has no recollection, had no recollection of this. So we say this happens often. The delirium of the ICU is frequent. So we use this as teaching to have such a person say, I have no, I can see myself in the picture. I have no memory of that. So let's shift gears a little bit. Recent studies question ICU and other use of exercise. So our drug of exercise may have side effects. There may be safety boundaries, yes. So is exercise a good thing to do all the time? Yes, well, possibly no. Might exercise not be such a good thing? Yes, we should be safe in looking at it scientifically to find the right dose for the right people, and how do we yield a benefit? Now, here's an interesting point. Being an intensivist, we think in terms of seconds and minutes and maybe hours. Exercise physiologist thinks in terms of weeks, weeks and months. So their time frame in their head is different. And in working with exercise physiologists, we had set off 15 years ago to do exercise in the ICU. And we said, oh, we'll do two or three days of this and we'll have people looking better. And they looked at us and said, what are you, nuts? Two or three days? How about 12 weeks? So we have to come together on our understanding of what an exercise can do in the time frame of testing for a benefit. 
that point will be borne out in a series of NIH studies where I might say at this point, having done the studies, we probably should have listened better to our so-called physiologists. So I'll show two studies where we poked at where the harm is from exercise. One is in COPD, and one is from the stroke literature. This is an extremely well done study looking at COPD exacerbation uh, patients in the hospital, printed in uh, British Medical Journal. They had almost 400 patients, six week intervention that started in the hospital, well done, well executed, well organized, no flaws, no flaws whatsoever. And what they found, 58% in their primary endpoint was they said, if we exercise like this, the problem of COPD occurring, recurring, and coming back in as a readmission will be lessened because we did this exercise for these patients. 58% of control were admitted. However, 62% of the intervention was admitted at 12 months. And this is why we need studies. Mortality, higher in the intervention group than in the control group. Not the outcome that was postulated when they designed the study. Why? At six weeks, actually, the intervention arm looked better in their walking performance, but there was a lesson learned. The lesson learned was you have to think about more therapies other than exercise. They did nothing, and naively, they did nothing about controlling for the therapies other than exercise. So what happened? The intervention arm people felt great. They said, how about pulmonary rehab? No thanks, I'm doing fine. And all the other folks said, yeah, pulmonary rehab, I probably should go do that. So more of the control people went to pulmonary rehab. It's not cause and effect, but that's postulated possibly what happened. And so now the thinking is when you design these studies, you have to control for heart failure therapies in both groups very tightly or COPD therapies. This is a very striking different type of story. This is a well-performed study. Um, New Zealand, Australian uh, primary investigators said, how about for hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke, we push the envelope further. Therapy here, we take lessons from the stroke therapy folks. And so to move it from within 24 hours to push it under 24 hours for the first time, we get people up and moving. So that was the intervention. And looking at a composite score, what they were able to find out not, they were able to actually exercise people earlier. This is the intervention arm. And 24 hours was the first touch in the usual care. But the ranking score was actually not so good in the people who got early intervention. There was a bit of a signal toward mortality. So it really has caused the community to say, we could touch the end point here of where the top of the curve is for early and type of exercise. I'm going to review four ICU-related exercise studies to tell you where the field is. So the first three were organized uh, by a colleague. The first one is a colleague of ours, Mark Moss, who's in Denver. Very well-designed study, NIH-funded, uh, looking at people four days on a ventilator with very explicit, detailed work and looking at them post-hospital. Unfortunately, for the 120 patients in there, that study was not able to show any differences in hospital or out of hospital. The study I was involved with was very similar, took a little bit of a different angle in looking, starting activity earlier, passive range of motion, physical therapy, and then trying to listen to our exercise physiologists, bringing in another component of how to move muscles, resistance exercise. So that looks like this very expensive intervention called a rubber band. So a TheraBand is the technical name, but using rubber bands to help produce resistance training. There is a difference between walking and using exercise resistance therapies. And the, the physiologists say that we train the nervous system as well. And so there are mu there's much literature in the non-ill population and some of the outpatient literature to say this is a way to hasten onset of change. So it was a randomized study, 300 patients. Uh, the primary endpoint was duration of hospitalization. And unfortunately, there were, I have to report, no, I'll repeat, no inpatient differences with this aggressive therapy. And each of these studies, the first two studies, had great differences in applied exercise. The intervention group exercised more. They didn't measure it, though. They were not able to measure a difference at hospital change. This group of patients 
in looking at an objective functional uh, test from the geriatric population called the SPPD, where there's three components, walking, balance, and getting out of the chair, a change of about one point's a big deal in the, ger in the geriatric literature. And at six months, these populations uh, had divergence in their functional scores and self-reported scores. So this is a glimmer, a glimmer that we may have something here to help patients coming out of ICU that may change their functionality. This may be the best. Um, this is a German study looking at ICU organization. The first two studies had a very research mindset. The research team came in and did the intervention. This well-done study said, we're going to do real-world stuff. The intervention is going to be get the unit. You already have a unit worth of people. Get them to organize the exercise. And when they did so, they organized it well, and they termed it interprofessional approach to closed-loop communication. The translation of that is, okay, who's getting the patient up with me today? That's what that meant. And they actually did it. They did it. They worked very hard to make it look well and carried out, and it decreased length of stay in the ICU. Their functional objective scores were better in the intervention. This may have something here that was different from the research team coming in. It's mobilizing, much more like a QI project, to getting the effects consistently in the ICU. The last we'll point out may be our future for what we do with ICU patients. As people know now, there's no funding insurance for getting people into pulmonary or cardiac rehab easily except for an MI. If you've left the ICU and go into a 12-week program for pulmonary rehab, there's no data. This may be the emergence of that kind of data. If you've been an ICU patient on organ support, this is a pilot study that hopefully will get funded by England as a larger study, but they had a different approach in saying we took mechanically ventilated patients, they controlled for everything now that we know to control of, excellently well done study, and they made sure that they listened to their exercise physiologists, and although the exercise physiologist was probably arguing for 12 or 24 weeks, they picked six weeks, and they did three sessions, two supervised, one unsupervised, they defined what failure was to not show up, so that was an important new def definition, but from a 60 patient study to have this glimmer, this may be the future for us because we need the information to go to our insuring agencies and bodies to say, this group of patients will benefit and we'll see if their actual readmissions are less doing this type of, type of intervention. Lastly, we'll leave with the recently published ATS, ACCP chest guidelines for weaning from mechanical ventilation. And within that, a group of investigators reviewing the literature now have put it as uh, organizing ourselves in the ICU to deliver what some might call mobilization or rehabilitation starting in the ICU. So I'll point that out to us. We're all responsible now for enacting on these guidelines as best we can, knowing the resources are limited in all of our institutions. So I'll sum it up here for us, and I would very much like to take questions and answer and hear some discussion. Emerging themes for ICU rehab multi-modality, bring in as many smart people as you can to make the drug as best as we can. It starts with initiating anti-gravity muscle movements and moving to more functional, adding in resistance exercise and initiated in the hospital, but I think we'll see more and more that hospital people and outpatient people might have to speak to each other about their patients. It's the same patients. We change, the patient's the same. So this may be a lesson to us that it may be more outpatient as well. And for our educational experts, please, please, please take to heart that it is important that our responsibility is to teach our colleagues who are junior but have much more potential possibly than we have to actually do well with this and help our patients to teach and put into curricula how we think and move our patients with activity guidelines and knowing how to prescribe exercise. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you so much. Well, months later, mm -hmm. uh, even though we recover back to 
fully see normal space. And hmm. I think part of it may be related. Hmm. One of your studies showed the difference between an NIC and an ICU chart. So one of the steps, one of the studies that actually did make a difference. I noticed that it was in an ICU chart. Mm -hmm. And the medical toxicologist explained that these studies on an ICU ICU are very different than an ICU because patients in the US ICU are very different than the traditional patients mm -hmm. in the MIT. Could you comment on that with your recommendation? It is. It's the first through it that size. So it is, of course, some might view it as a difference in the size of the patient. It's the first through it that size. So it is, of course, some might view it as a difference. Uh, the purists of internal medicine might view it as a limitation because it's a surgical ICU. But in reality, they had patients in there who had belly surgeries and on the ventilator. In some ways, they are different from the MICU flat out septic shock in recovery patients. But it's a start. What was different is, in that study, how they approached the intervention. They took on the responsibility with the groups of people already in the ICU and said, we have to do it ourselves. We're not going to have a fancy research team come in and do this. Let's see if we can do it. So that was thought of as the next generation for how we do these studies. That needs to be replicated now in a medical ICU to see if there's an outcome difference as they found in the surgical ICU. Good point. Good idea. Wonderful. You have pointed out a topic where now there are whole day conferences to discuss. Um, we can, I'll repeat the, the, the question. How do we start enabling our patients when we have, in each of our institutions, not the resources we would like? And this goes not only for inpatient, it goes for outpatient. And when we have these types of discussions with our outpatient colleagues, they, I've got to run through all these checklists. I've got 10 minutes. I've got 35 patients to see. How can I possibly do an exercise prescription? Our responsibility is to do best for our patients, so we have to figure out where our priorities are for them. But there's always, within our areas, to figure out my approach to getting some people moved more than being horizontal and unconscious may be different from what's in yours because you may have a little bit different components. I may use more of a respiratory therapist and a nurse. You have an occupational therapist and a respiratory. OK, let's see if we can get it done that way. It doesn't have to be five minute miles, but more than horizontal and unconscious in moving someone toward the trajectory of what are they going to look like in six months and starting it. And, and so we also have to put into that equation, and <laughs> this may sound funny, I do feel when we have these discussions with administrators, they're well-intentioned people for the most part. And they have this pie to chop up. So how do we help them say, is it worthwhile to spend $150,000 on a, a physical therapist to bring into the ICU? How will that help the patients? Will it have an outcome? There may not be a profit to it, but how does, where's the literature? We need the literature to be better to help that argument. So in the meantime, as we're arguing for it, we have to find out how do we, in our local system, help develop that team of exercise. Dr. Morris, I thought was lamenting that our trainees may not be as well prepared to engage in resuscitation. And I told him that doesn't happen in my place because Laura Brown will not allow it. That's Hi, Laura. Excellent work. <laughs> Who's next for questions?
Good point. Good point. Thank you. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. Wonderful. You are you're pushing the curve of prehab fees. That's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Yes. We do. Um, we have close contact with our nutrition experts, and I was also taught as a resident and a fellow that. There's nothing that ruins a great argument like great data. And we don't have much data in the ICU for this. We find a lot of people who are vitamin D deficient. The NIH has spent $80 million on the next generation of the ARDS network. They call it the PEDAL network, or prevention and early treatment of lung injury. And their third study is going to be an intervention for low vitamin D patients in the ICU with vitamin D. So yes, it has hit the ICU, absolutely. Now, I don't know the answer. So we're just starting that study up, but it is, it's being discussed. And we need folks like yourself to help us. What dose? How often? How long? How do we measure? <laughs> yeah. Good point. Absolutely. Yes, sir. You hit on the central theme. Um, I'll say two things because of time. One, I would point people to read the work of Ramona Hopkins. Ramona Hopkins is at Utah. Ramona Hopkins was an ICU nurse, and I don't think she'll mind me saying this. Her son was injured, uh, TBI, and she went to experts and said, how do I know what's going to happen after his ICU stay? And she found the field to be empty. So she created the field, and she went back and got her PhD and was a department chair out there, and has defined the field of ICU-related cognitive deficits, and she has pushed this field wonderfully, so the rest of us now get it. And you hear her lecture on this, and you realize, we don't get the brain back. We, don't get, we shouldn't get any points. So that really should be our focus. And this lecture today was on musculoskeletal, uh, maybe peripheral nervous system, but the real catch is, can they do their checkbook, and do they know what their car keys are for? 
So I would applaud you for bringing that up. There are a few pilots out there looking at not only how to measure this best, but also can you do a cognitive intervention early on? And would a cognitive intervention help with the outcomes that you described so well? Yes. What is known about how exercise may trigger inflammation back to the employer? Interesting. Um, probably a lot more than I know. Uh, I am impressed with the literature that sounds like this, Jesse, that from geriatric literature and from animal models, when we put an organism into training, I thought if I do more push-ups, you get stronger because your biceps gets bigger. And the experts will tell you eventually, but actually when you look at fiber size in beginning of training, you don't see any change. And what's interesting is you have performance change. So you start an exercise program, I get performance change in the first several sessions with no change in my muscles that we can detect by size. What are we changing? So we're changing potentially, it's neural adaptation is what our experts tell us. So we have to have neural adaptation as well as big fiber size to get a better performance. So it's not just muscle, so you're very much on key to say it's central and peripheral nervous system as well. So I am betting on my neural adaptation as opposed to muscle size. But uh, this was great, okay? So everybody who comes here, we have a tradition. We want to we want to load every institution with a slugger. Be glad to. Yeah, that's okay? beautiful. So you can walk around the hallway, get people <laughs> off their couches. Come on, do some exercise. Dr. Peter Morris, Mr. Oh. Brown Lounge, University of Louisville, April 25th, 2017. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Precious. And you guys have a good Thursday. Thank you.